Okay. Good evening, everybody. All right. I think I'm just checking to make sure everything is running properly. I think it is. So, okay. Uh, very good. Thanks, everybody, for joining me tonight. Tonight, uh, welcome to session number 163 of Exploring the Lord of the Rings. Uh, tonight, we are going to finish uh, the confrontation between... Um, Gandalf and Saruman. Um, uh, I'm confident we're going to get through the rest of the confrontation today. We've been looking at this for the last two weeks. Uh, we saw the big sort of set piece recruitment speech last the week before last, and then last week we were looking at his sort of more personal approach. Um, and the conclusion that I was coming to uh, was that uh, we um, that Saruman is basically probing to try to see if whether or not Gandalf himself has the ring uh, because he believes that Gandalf has found it and seems incapable of imagining that Gandalf would not want to use it uh, if he found it. So, um, we're going to be looking at that. Just a couple quick announcements before we begin. First, I just wanted to invite you to check out uh, the Signum store. Uh, if you go to signumuniversity.org uh, and you look at our, uh, our support uh, menu, you'll find a link to our store. There's also a link to our store there on our blog. Um, uh, anyway, you can go to our store on Redbubble. You can search for us on uh, for Signum University on, on Redbubble. We've got uh, a really fun store there. We've got a couple new uh, designs in the store, uh, which have been uploaded recently. Um, I am uh, uh, I am really excited to get... Uh, I haven't decided what I'm going to get it on yet, but I'm uh, like, what what item I'm going to get it on. I'm going to get on a shirt uh, or something else, but I, I'm really looking forward to uh, getting uh, getting one of our Beware the Leopard designs. Um, uh, so that's going to be really fun. I, I'm, I'm thinking maybe of getting that on a mask, uh, JJ, actually. Um, I think that would be fun. Um, but, uh, but we'll see. Uh, so anyway, uh, I encourage you to go and uh, look at those. And there are also going to be a couple uh, holiday designs that are going to be released soon. So keep an eye, uh, keep an eye out for that. Um, and in addition, the other announcement I would like to make, um, we're, uh, we're, we're brewing up some new interesting things here at Signum uh, this fall. And uh, there's a, there's actually a big new program that we are planning to launch soon. Um, can't tell you too much about it yet. More details will be forthcoming. Um, but we are looking at uh, some activities for kids, some after school activities for kids. Um, and uh, I'm really, really excited about the things that we're going to offer. I know that's a, you know, as a parent, I, 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 you know, I've got two. Well, OK, I keep saying I have two teenagers. My younger son is technically 12, but he's like he kind of counts. Um, uh, anyway, so we um, uh, were I, as I'm keenly aware of the struggle that a lot of people have had uh, lately in the current environment with uh, really good uh, like after school programs. A lot of school districts are struggling to just get you know, classes working and everything together, a lot of after school stuff and uh, um, you know, sort of extracurricular activities have really kind of fallen uh, uh, by the way. And uh, so anyway, this is something this is something that we're working on. Uh, and I'm uh, I'm really excited about uh, about our offerings. More information on that coming soon. Uh, but uh, just wanted to kind of let you guys know that that's happening. So um uh, anyway, that is that is what's. I see a number of guesses. Uh, no, no, it's not a Pokemon League, uh, nor is it a rugby club. No, no, that's not happening either. Uh, but um, nor a Quidditch team. No, no, no. This is this is going to be contact free, um, which a rugby team is not in any sense, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, it's it's um, uh, there's. Uh, it's going to be a lot of really fun opportunities that I'm uh, that I'm excited about. So we'll see. We will see what happens. But uh, uh, I will have more information on that soon. Just wanted to warn you that it was happening. Uh, Germanic philology for elementary schoolers. Closer, Sam. Closer. Uh, very, very much closer. Um, <laughs> but anyway, uh, okay. I'm gonna let's uh, let's. Uh, start things up here. Um, the first 
thing I wanted to go back and talk about uh, uh, one of the, well, not a post so much as a discussion uh, from our discussion board. Um, I don't have a really good mechanism for posting the whole discussion. It was a long discussion, and I, I you know, want to read out the whole thing. So here's a crude synopsis of three of the sort of chief points of this discussion. The discussion was on the subject of Saruman's ring. Um, so Kate uh, begins um, by sort of, you know, uh, sort of articulating the argument for the ring, Saruman's ring, Saruman's ring of power, uh, as a persuasion enhancement, right? That this is one of the things that he is really good, you know, so just looking at the pattern, she was looking at the patterns of the rings, in particular, the elven rings, uh, the dwarf rings and human rings, she points out, are not really good data points in trying to figure out how, you know, rings of power are kind of designed to work, because those were designed to be traps, right? They don't sort of work normally or work properly. They were, uh, um, you know, they were, uh, they're, 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 the function of them was to, you know, entrap and destroy, essentially, if, you know, indifferent, not like just destroy, but um, uh, to entrap and ensnare the uh, the wielders. So they're not really a good sample of what like a ring of power is meant to do. The one ring and the three are more, are clearer guides of kind of the principle behind a ring of power. Um, and in both of them, we can see uh, that the, you know, Sar Sauron, He's already pretty good at dominating the wills of others. It's one of his specialities, and apparently the ring is meant to enhance that in some way, to give him even, you know, a, a, in some sense, a kind of a greater edge in um, um, in dominating the wills of others. The elven rings are, are we're told, do like what the elves want, right? They help them to achieve uh, their goals. They sort of give them some of the things that they desire as well. Um, you know, the healing and preservation of things. Um, so again, there's this sort of enhancement of like this, what the wielder already does, right? And is already good at. And so for that reason, she was suggesting that it's uh, uh, that the most logical conclusion for what the power of Saruman's ring would be would be as an enhancement of his persuasive ability. And that certainly would have been handy. Um, you know, uh, what he was doing, I mean, the game that Saruman was playing with the White Council is... Um, this is a this is a high stakes game he's been playing right for some time so um, that I think is uh, uh, is a a good argument I think I agree that that's a really big deal and so then she was further arguing that Gandalf um, you know his conversation with Gandalf right here is essentially a kind of a test case right that he's kind of trying it out um, you know uh, can I can I use it to bamboozle Gandalf? And so even the kind of different registers that we see him operating in um, may be a sort of a reflection of like, uh, to, you know, to, and we were kind of joking about him testing me like, is this thing on? Right. But, um, you know, what's going to work? I mean, if he can deliver that original speech and bring Gandalf around, <laughs> boy, this thing is working great. Right. I don't know. Maybe not that. Maybe something else. Right. So anyway, just to sort of see him probing, um, in uh, in different ways, um, so I I agree that I think that that's um, uh, that that's interesting. Uh, Flamifer responded and said that uh, th th that's th agreed that that was very likely, but he also proposed a second possibility was that perhaps uh, his ring was meant to be defensive in some way. That is, it's meant to equip the wearer uh, to uh, sort of protect himself from the domination of other people's wills, and. Um, that also makes a certain amount of sense. I think that Flamifer has an interesting argument there. Um, uh, the primary thing that I would say in support of that argument is that, remember what his original job description was, right? As Saruman the White, his job was to study the devices of the enemy. Uh, and, to, you know, he was supposed to be working against Sauron so that he has, A, studied Sauron's ring lore very carefully. So, like, if anybody has... The, an idea for how to resist the power of Sauron's domination, and especially the kind of, you know, of domination that was, uh, you know, sort of uh, embodied or, uh, you know, not personified, but uh, you know, embodied, let's just stick with that, in the ring, um, then uh, uh, Saruman would know about that, right? So it would be like a closer, more direct kind of misapplication 
of his original purpose, right? Of his original function. Um, and there's something that's kind of attractive about that, right? It's like he's almost doing the right thing. He's almost doing what he's supposed to do, um, except not quite. And indeed, you can even see that this this seems to be the kind of thing. I don't mean a ring specifically, but this seems to be the kind of thing that Gandalf has in mind when he chooses to go to Orthanc in the first place. Remember that he said that he was thinking in response to Radagast's um, uh, message Message, that perhaps Saruman had, you know, come up with something that would enable them to resist the Nine, right? And so there is almost um, uh, an anticipation, a guess on Gandalf's part that perhaps Saruman has been doing research, which has borne fruit in this way, right? And could could enable them to, uh, to, to, you know, so the idea of him somehow devising some sort of anti-Sauron you know, weapon, defense, something like that, that seems to be consistent with what Gandalf thinks, right, when he heads to Orthanc in the first place. So I I find Flamifer's suggestion very plausible as well. And then he was also laying out how, um, uh, if that were the case, he could also be testing this against Gandalf, right? Um, can he, especially if he suspects that Gandalf might have the ring, right? He would, uh, he would sort of want to bolster himself uh, against this confrontation with Gandalf, um, and even as a way to sort of uh, use the confrontation with Gandalf as a kind of sort of practice or test, uh, because of course he would want to free himself from Sauron's control um, and to be able to sort of wrest the Palantir to his own uh, will again and get out from under Sauron's thumb uh, to some extent. So I, I think that that's interesting. Now, Amy's Revenge was uh, uh, was uh, suggesting further. He was kind of like uh, redefining Kate's point originally um, uh, using some uh, numbers and things. And basically working through logically what the test would mean, right? That if Gandalf, if Saruman has a ring of power, presumably the one ring, you know, I, I, one of the great rings would enable you to, to kind of get past that, right? To, um, you know, you, you wouldn't be affected by Saruman's ring probably in the same way. Um, so, you know, Saruman is thinking, Again, this is one way to test whether or not Gandalf has the ring, and uh, um, and you know if he's able to sway him, he clearly doesn't have it. If he can't, then maybe he does. And um, but of course, he points out that Gandalf actually having the ring of fire would seem to foul up that test. Uh, and and uh, anyway, so it was, it was a very interesting discussion, um, and um, I, um, uh, Alex, and yes. Evil Dr. Cannon, you're right that Elrond's comment about the, which we're coming up to, we'll be getting to in just a few weeks, I'm sure, um, his comment about how it's dangerous to study too deeply the arts of the enemy um, does suggest that some, like, I, I, he, do, he also seems to acknowledge the kind of research, right, that Saruman was doing um, that seems... Um, that seems to me to uh, to to kind of make sense in some sense, um, but um, yeah. I, now I agree, Dracon. If I had to choose between, if I was forced to choose which one is the more probable, I think I agree with you that Saruman's own character would suggest that he's more likely to make something offensive than defensive, um, dominating others. Um, and resisting domination, he says, seems to be almost mutually exclusive kinds of power. See the hobbits' resistance to the ring, uh, which seems to stem from their humility, the way the Dark Lords weaken themselves by putting forth their power into others. Um, yeah, yeah, no, I agree. I agree. I, 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 that would seem to me more his speed as well. Um, the thing that I found appealing about Fram Flamifer's suggestion is the way in which one could easily see that research have started you know, the research into that, you know, the sort of defensive ring of power as a, um, started with the best of intentions. Like, I believe that he really was the white wizard, you know, originally. Um, but he sort of worked himself out of it, right? Sort of worked himself around. Um, so I kind of like the idea of him basically taking the work that he was doing as the white wizard. So instead of saying, no, I'm. I have reversed everything long ago, right? I've I've not been working for you know uh, uh, um, 
against Sauron all along. I've I've just been parodying him um, from the beginning, uh, or from a very very long time ago. That's very possible, right? That his uh, that that it would be the effect of studying the arts of the enemy too closely. That he comes to emulate him instead of to re- instead of to resist him. But I do find appealing the idea that there is like a way in which Saruman can still convince himself that he's still the good guy, right? That he's still resisting Sauron, setting up on his own, establishing himself as as a power, right? Um, that is easy to rationalize, as he suggests in that very first short paragraph, his declamation part, right, um, of his speech. They, like, the world of men is coming that they must rule. Obviously, they're the most qualified people, the wizards are, to rule the world of men, right? If, you know, this is what it means that the world is changing in the way that it, that it has been, right? You know, elves, Numenor, that was the past, right? What is the future like? Clearly, the future is the age of men, and we must rule them, and to rule them, we must have power. So it's easy to see how this kind of line of reasoning could lead him to do many of the things that he has done without really seeing, believing, suspecting uh, that he's become one of the bad guys, right? So I kind of, uh, I kind of like the idea of his ring being a thing which you could see like a good intention, right, from the beginning. That he was, in fact, developing something like Gandalf suspected he might have developed, right? A, a weapon to be used against Sauron, a weapon that, because, I mean, presumably it would have helped him against the Nine, right? Um, it could even be quite literally exactly what Gandalf was hoping for. It's just not at all how he's going to apply it, right? Um, but um, uh, anyway, so... But at the end of the day, I do think that Kate and uh, Mike's suggestions are probably more likely. That it is more likely that what he would do is try to enhance his own power uh, and his own power to dominate the wills of others. That um, that um, seems to me most likely at the end of the day. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway, okay. Um, Let's get back to the text. So I'm not going to read the whole thing. I just I kept the first two parts up here because, you know, last week I wanted to refer back to the earlier ones. So I want to look at the whole thing. So remember, we ended up with, um, uh, as he said this, a lust which he could not conceal shone suddenly in his eyes. Um, why do the nine ask for the Shire and what is your business there? Um, he is suggest. So it's interesting that the the Nazgul themselves provide for him what seems to be the final piece of evidence, right? The undeniable piece of evidence. Um, You've been hanging out in the Shire. Gandalf, clearly, he's had something up his sleeve all along, right? I mean, obviously, nobody is going to just, like, selflessly help these weird, strange, useless little people up in the Shire, right? Gandalf must have had an angle all along, right? Um, So it's clear to Saruman that he's been up to something, um, and now he thinks he knows what it is, right? Um, and uh, the evidence of the Nazgul seems to really weigh in that. Um, okay. Saruman, I said, standing away from him. Remember, Saruman had approached him and laid his hand on his arm. Only one hand at a time can wield the one, and you know that well, so do not trouble to say we. But I would not give it, nay, I would not give even news of it to you, now that I learn your mind. You were the head of the council, but you have unmasked yourself at last. Well, the choices are, it seems, to submit to Sauron or to yourself. I will take neither. Have you others to offer? He was cold now and perilous. Yes, he said. I did not expect you to show wisdom, even in your own behalf. But I gave you the chance of aiding me willingly, and so saving yourself much trouble and pain. The third choice is to stay here until the end. Until what end? Until you reveal to me where the one may be found, I may find means to persuade you, or until it is found in your despite, and the ruler has time to learn to turn to lighter matters, to devise, say, a fitting reward for the hindrance and insolence of Gandalf the Grey. That may not prove to be one of the lighter matters, said I. He laughed at me, for my words were empty, and he knew it. Okay. Um... Gandalf's response. Um, 
Yeah, yeah. Um, that is really interesting, isn't it, Mike? Uh, the uh, the progression, uh, his re- reference to the ruler, capital R. Um, I do see that, Mike, as a direct drift from his references to the power earlier on. Now, mind, here I think he's being much more deliberately ambivalent. Um, I talked about how I, you know, why I think he's being deliberately impersonal, right? Why he doesn't say Sauron himself. He's not recruiting for Sauron, even though Gandalf accuses him of that. That's not exactly what he's doing. Um, He is leading up to another plan, right? Because, of course, if he were to get the Ring of Power, then he would have the power. He would be the power. Um, And so that drift here, Mike, from power, capital P, to ruler, capital R, um, and the ruler has time to turn to lighter matters, it is very clear, I think, here, that he's thinking of himself, right? Um, He is certainly hoping that he is the one who will then... Uh, be devising a fitting reward for the hindrance and insolence of Gandalf the Grey. Um, but he can't do it till he gets the ring. So, you know, he's working on that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Um, but let's go back to the start here. I don't want to jump to the end. Gandalf physically steps away, right, distancing himself from this sort of conspiratorial mode, and thus he sends a very clear nonverbal signal, right, along with his verbal rebuke. But his verbal rebuke is itself interesting, right? He begins by pointing out the emptiness of Saruman's speech, right? He's encouraging Gandalf that they could rule together. Um, and Gandalf immediately deflates that. Only one hand at a time can wield the one, and you know that well, so do not trouble to say we. Right? There's no question of them becoming collaborators in rule with, like, what, sharing the One Ring? Right? Clearly that's not possible. So, um, what Saruman really means, right, what he's actually saying is, give me the ring so that I can rule. Um, and uh, now, I don't think that Sauron was actually, um, uh, I don't think that uh, S- uh, Saruman, sorry, I don't think that Saruman was actually, you know, trying to imply that they could both have it exactly. I mean, if we go back again to that first speech, uh, we'll remember that he was talking about things like as the power grows, it's proved friends would grow, right? Um That is, I think what he's offering to Gandalf here is spot as chief friend of the power, right? Um, I mean, he does say things uh, uh, like um, the power would pass to us, right? Um, So he is including Gandalf in that. Um, I don't think that he's... um, I guess I don't think that he's gone very far, you know, in attempting to deceive Gandalf here. But again, what Gandalf does do pretty clearly is indicate, you know, that I'm not um, I'm not buying it. Right. I'm not buying that you really want to collaborate now. Right. That you are actually looking to take me in um, uh, as a colleague here. Right. Um, in other words, your offer is really transparent. I mean, that like it's, I can see plainly your own desire, right? Um, your own lust for power. That's, um, let's not, let's not attempt to conceal that, right? Let's not pretend we're going to be collaborators here. Um, But I would not give it. Nay, I would not give even news of it to you, now that I learn your mind. And that, to me, is a fascinating sentence, and one I think that I never really placed enough weight on. Again, in the context, I've been talking over the last couple weeks how it seems clearer and clearer, um, as I think about this passage carefully and I think about its context, that Saruman 
believes that Gandalf must either have claimed the ring or be hiding it. There's that's the only two options, right? Um, Gandalf responding by saying, I would not give it to you. Um, is almost an acknowledgement, right? I mean, I saw somebody say something along um, uh, along those lines earlier on just a little bit further up. Um, yeah, yeah, Stunned Duck was saying this. Um, it's, 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 it's almost an admission, right? But notice how he seems to... Um, he seems to understand that that's what Saruman is looking for, Right? And this is the thing that I think I never really got before. Um, he hears what this all boils down to. Saruman saying, Gandalf, do you have the ring? If so, give it to me. Right? It would be wise to give it to me. I'm the one who should have it. And if I have it, lots of really good things will happen as a consequence. Right? We can oppose Sauron. We can throw down Sauron. The power would pass to us. That is away from Sauron. That's a good thing. Right? Um, give it to me, the head of the council, uh, and uh, I will, and we can, you know, go on and achieve our agenda items, knowledge, rule, order, you know, it'll be great. Um, and Gandalf immediately picks up on this, right? He knows exactly what Saruman is saying. I would not give it to you. Nay, I would not give even news of it to you, now that I learn your mind. Um, yeah, now that I see what you're really after, what you're really about here, um, I would not give news of it, and I certainly would not give it itself. This is what Saruman's persuasion has been pointed towards. That's Gandalf. He surely has news of it. He may even have it himself. It might even be on him right now. Um, and so his what he's trying to persuade him to do ultimately is give him the ring. That whole first speech is a set. He's not trying to recruit him to Sauron's army. It's a setup. It's a setup for the give me the ring speech. This is why it's best. It's wise if I have the ring. Um, then there's that damning statement of Gandalf's. You were the head of the council. You were head of the council. Were, past tense. You're not head of the council anymore, right? Um, you have kicked yourself off the council by your admission. Gandalf stating that so baldly, right? just piercing through any attempt that Saruman has been making uh, to um, any attempt that Saruman has been make uh, has has been making to um, uh, you know kind of um, deceive himself deceive Gandalf as well that his intentions are still good, that this is just the wisest and shrewdest possible way to oppose their enemy. Um, yeah, no, no. He's not even saying, like, I'm going to put in a referendum that you be removed from the council later on. Uh, no, he's like, look, you, you've you've unmasked yourself. at le This is an unmasking that has just happened here, Saruman, right? Um, this is a mask, right? You've been wearing this mask. Um, not only have you failed to put on a mask that's going to deceive me right here, but what you've done right here has revealed that you've been wearing a mask for some time, right? At one point, you were the head of the council. Um, now, you know, it's not even a question of now. You've not been the head of the council for a while. Um, the mask, the mask is off. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, WKU says it also supports the idea that his position isn't a political one, but one of duty. He's neglected his duty, so he is no longer in the position he once was, right? Like, a, yeah, so, okay, so, I mean, honestly, WKU, you could say, um, essentially by saying he's not the White Wizard anymore, right? I mean, Saruman said that, right? Saruman said, you know, he's... Uh, 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 you know, white is only a beginning. He's moved on from white, in which case, 
you're not the head of the council, right? Um, you've not been the head of the council ever since you made that particular call. Um, by the way, I don't know how it comes across on Twitch on my screen. Um, uh, I'm wearing this shirt in honor of uh, Saruman today. This is my uh, Technicolor shirt of many colors. The webcam often uh, turns this shirt into a wild psychedelic uh, array of patterns. Uh, so I, I'm wearing it in honor of Saruman here today. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. Um, Interesting. Yeah. Fourth Dauntless uh, points out that Saruman is a parallel to Sauron here. He can no longer hide himself behind a fair appearance as Sauron cannot. Um, yes. Now, of course, he's not like literally lost that. Like S Sauron can't like he physically can't take a fair form anymore. Um, but um, but but I agree that there is a parallel. Right. Just as, uh, you know, Sauron's like the the sort of the punishment of for Sauron, what Sauron did first as Anatar and then in Numenor, um, the result is he can't he can't take a fair form at all anymore. Saruman has unmasked himself, um, and there's no putting that mask back on. Certainly not to conceal him from the other members of the council, right? Um, yeah, yeah, um, agreed. The choices are, it seems, to submit to Sauron or to yourself. Um, once again, I, um, um, I, I love how Gandalf's response, um, just is, his response is just in straight, bald statements. Like, I'm going to translate you. So let me sum up, says Gandalf, right? I should submit to Sauron or I can submit to you. That's what you're, that's what you're telling me here. That's what all of this essentially boils down to. Um, all of the, you know, about their means and their ends and the rule of the world of men and the power that is rising and the proved friends of the power and, um, uh, and you know, join with me. There is wisdom in that. And, you know, we can guide the, all of this stuff, right? All this stuff. The power would pass to us. Um, it all comes down to one of two things. Either we submit to Sauron or you submit to me. Um, the latter, of course, being a sort of a restatement of what he said in his first sentence about not troubling to say we, right? Don't give me this we can, the power would pass to us business, right? It's not, it's not going to happen that way. Um, it's, uh, it's going to be about me submitting to you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Have you others to offer? I will take neither. Have you others to offer? Um, have you others to offer? Um, I do. Somebody was saying earlier on that um, uh, that Gandalf is quite snarky uh, in these in his responses to Saruman here, um, and I agree. I love the snark of that last. Uh, uh, question, right? Like, I've been so enjoying your proposal, Saruman. I, do you have some more, right? I have, I'm, I'm, I'm still waiting uh, for that really attractive offer that you've doubtless been saving until the end, right? So uh, uh, what, a, what else you got there, Saruman, since you're giving me choices? Uh, what else do you have? Um, and um, uh, 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 yeah, yeah. And so Saruman does not like it. He was cold now and perilous. Yes, I did not expect you to show wisdom even in your own behalf, but I gave you the chance of aiding me willingly and so saving yourself much trouble and pain. The third choice is to stay here until the end. Um, yeah, he is giving Saruman sauce. That is, uh, that is how, uh, how Sam would say it. Uh, Druid's fire, I agree. Um, yep. Yeah. Um, and music, all you're absolutely right. The way that he's holding himself above this sort of false dichotomy that uh, Saruman is establishing. I agree. I think it's exactly right. Um, and um, uh, but Saruman, Saruman doesn't like it. Right. Um, now, his cold and perilous mood. I wonder. I'm trying to understand it. I mean, 
I don't think he's just affronted. I mean, I think he is affronted, but I don't think he's just affronted, like offended by Gandalf's snark, exactly. Or is he upset that his persuasion seems to have failed so completely with Gandalf? Is he um, trying to interpret what this means? Um, Because, listen, we know the kind of assumptions that he makes about Gandalf, right? Um, And remember, I think, that he thinks it's very possible that Gandalf has the ring, right? That Gandalf has already claimed the ring. Does this prove... Gandalf's response, I mean. Does Gandalf's response prove that he has? Does this seem... Is is Saruman thinking that, like, okay, it's on then. I'm definitely facing the new ring lord. Is that what he's thinking? When he's cold and perilous there? I mean, everything that Gandalf said would be consistent with that, right? Only one hand at a time can wield the one. And it will be mine, not yours. Is that what Saruman is hearing? I would not give it. He says in a theoretical designed, you know, in a, 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 a feeble attempt to conceal the truth, right, further. Um, I would not give it. Okay, so you've got it. You, you're, you, you're going to, you want to control it yourself. You won't share the power or give the power to me. Um, you've refused to give it, right? You bring in some frankly irrelevant nonsense about being head of the council as if anybody cares. This is what matters, right? Our power struggle right here is what matters. Um, I will take neither. I, I, I defy you, right? I defy, I am not going to submit to Sauron. I'm not going to submit to yourself. Have you others to offer? Again, I'm putting myself into Saruman's viewpoint, right? Into the viewpoint of somebody who looks at things the way that Saruman does and who suspects that Gandalf might have the ring. What is the other, um, what is the other option that Saruman could have to offer? Right, either submit to Sauron, submit to me, or I'm still waiting for the offer that says you'll serve me. Right, um, uh, that uh, I will rule and uh, you'll be the helper. <laughs> right, um, um, yeah, yeah. Um, I do think that that whole paragraph is theoretically consistent with Gandalf having the ring if Saruman thinks that he has the ring. But I don't think. Right? Yeah. Fourth Dauntless says, I'm joking, but Gandalf will later offer Saruman that exact deal. Yeah. Come out and help. Right? Come out and help however you can. Yes. Exactly. Exactly. Not... To serve the new ring lord, right? Um, but but yeah, no, exactly. That's exactly sort of the. Um, there are definitely multiple other choices which Saruman could present to him, right? Um, however, I don't think. When we look at the passage as a whole, I think it's clear that Saruman no longer believes that Gandalf has the one. Um, by the time we get to the end, right? Um, I did not expect you to show wisdom even in your own behalf, is the sentence that particularly jumps out at me. Um, I did not expect you to show wisdom even in your own behalf. On the one hand, that clearly means obviously going along with me, you know, submitting either to Sauron or to myself would be wise, right? I mean, that's obviously the path of wisdom here, Gandalf. And you're not going to take it. You're going to stick to, like, what you believe to be the good path, right? Because you're a fool. Um, And so you're going to keep uselessly resisting. Um, But, um, uh, you know, it's... um, uh, So, and, And I do think he means that in the one sense. But again, I did not expect you to show wisdom even in your own behalf. Is it possible to paraphrase that clause? as 
Dude, you are such an idiot. You didn't even take the ring, did you? You don't have it. You found the ring and you left it behind? Are you for real right now? Right? I mean, what a moron you are, right? I mean, I knew you were a fool, but for crying out loud. Um, you know, that's... Um, Exactly, JJ. I don't think, you know, his laughter at Gandalf at the end suggests to me that he believes that Gandalf doesn't have it. Right. Um, so I don't think that he thinks that anymore by the end. Um, Gandalf has said, I'm going to defy you. So Gandalf has suggested a couple things, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, well, Fort, okay, Fort Dauntless is saying, I always understood in your own behalf to mean to avoid much pain to yourself. Yeah, in one sense, I think. But even in your own behalf, it means like on your own part. Like, I, you, you know, like you, you can't even look out for yourself, right? Um, I did not expect you to show wisdom even in your own behalf. That is to say, like, first... You need to figure out, like, what is the wisest course for you personally to take, and then maybe you can set out to try to advise others about how they might wa make wise choices. But, like, you failed step one, Gandalf, right? Like, you can't even show enough wisdom to be able to make the right call, to make the difficult choice, right? Which is obviously the right choice. No, you... Know where the ring of power is. You're going to just try to conceal it, I guess, right? What, hope that Sauron doesn't find it? You have no chance of defeating Sauron. That's ridiculous, right? Um, to take the ring yourself would have been presumptuous, but, you know, um, at least that itself is like the smart call, right? That's the wise choice on your own behalf. Right. It's going to give Gandalf the best chance to possibly resist Sauron in the future. Right. Remember, Gandalf himself knows he doesn't have the power even to resist all nine together with the Witch King. Well, if he had the Ring of Power, he would. No problems. Right. Um, so, um, yeah, yeah. Um, so anyway, that's, I believe, what he means when he says you've. I did not expect you to show wisdom even on your own behalf, much less on the behalf of others, right? Much less to show wisdom in leading and guiding and advising other people, right? Um, uh, that is, I've always known that, you know, you were on the side of folly when it came to, like, what we, the good guys, right, what, what the council should do. Um, now it's clear you can't even look after yourself. I mean, please. Um, yeah, but you're exactly right, GDC. Um, uh, the assumption that Saruman is making about how acting on the Istari's own behalf should be the primary objective shows how far he's fallen from his original mission. Absolutely. His definition of wisdom, right, of what the wise course is. Gandalf is wise enough to know that choosing the path which is best calculated, that which seems best calculated to bring victory is not always wise because means and ends in fact matter. If you just use the weapons of the enemy to throw down the enemy, you are not wise. You are a fool, right? You are not going to accomplish anything good and you're only going to bring your own self to destruction. In fact, again, it's almost the opposite of what Saruman says, right? Uh, doing that is to show folly first on your own behalf and then on everybody else's as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, totally agree with that. Um, so, I did not expect you to show wisdom even in your own behalf, but I gave you the chance of aiding me willingly and so saving yourself much trouble and pain. Um, clearly, showing wisdom in the larger context of this sentence means submitting to me, right? Um, and that, I think, means not only, you know, like bowing down and accepting my power and authority, but also um, 
like acknowledging that my argument and my way of looking at things is is right, you know, is sort of is is the right one. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I totally agree, GDC. Uh, the means not justifying the ends is almost baked into the Legendarium's cosmology. Absolutely. Um, that it is a very consistent principle of uh, the way Tolkien's Legendarium works, uh, that the ends do not justify the means. Um, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so here's my question. When does Saruman come to suspect? When does Saruman conclude that Gandalf doesn't have the ring? When does Saruman make that conclusion? It's clear when he says, the third choice is to stay here until the end. Until what end? Asks Gandalf. Until you reveal to me where the one may be found. So, until you hand over the one is not on the table to him. Right? By this point in the conversation, he seems clearly to know. Believe. that Gan He still believes Gandalf knows where it is. But he now no longer believes that Gandalf has it. So, when does he draw that conclusion? Is there something in that first speech there? I would not give it. I would not give even news of it to you now that I learn your mind. Is that enough of a, you know, saying, yep, no, man, I don't, I don't, I don't have it. Um, but he says both evenly. That is, he uses the same expression, I would not give it, I would not give even news of it to you. It is clear that, okay, he might not have it, but he does have news of it, right? So he is, his declaration that he would not give either the ring or news of the ring to Saruman doesn't itself seem to me to be quite a sufficient declaration, if you see what I mean. Um... Uh, I'm only saying that's when someone who had the ring would whip it out and use it, right? That is, uh, um, his resp so basically, uh, Emily, the mere fact that he does not, like, one of the other things that Saruman would be doing is... That is one of the other objectives of his speeches. If Gandalf does have the ring and has claimed it for himself, he's going to push Gandalf either to... He's going to try to convince him to give it up. But if he can't, he's got to get him to show himself. Um, and I think he's probably... Um, uh, I think that he's probably... I mean, what the fact that he's wearing his ring suggests that he's armed for bear. Right? I think he's ready to go with Gandalf. He's expecting a fight. Um, that's kind of, to me, the irony of um, uh, the irony of the, of course, the big, slightly, not slightly, quite comical uh, combat scene in the movies is, is ironic to me, right? Because Peter Jackson envisions happening exactly what does not happen, right? Um, Saruman seems to anticipate it, I think. He's anticipating it. Um, but, um, uh, but Gandalf refuses it. Right? Gandalf does not fight. Um, Gandalf won't fight him. Um, he won't submit to him, but he doesn't fight him. Um, yeah. Um, See, but Trifle, I don't think Gandalf would have mastered the one, necessarily. Um, yeah, so Trifle's saying that 
goading the new ring lord into a fight would be a big risk for Saruman. First of all, Trifle, what are his options? Right? He needs the ring. He's got to get the ring of power. If Gandalf has claimed it, what's he going to do? Try to convince him to hand it over. He's done that. Right? If that doesn't work, what's plan B? I mean, other than fight him for it. Other than pry it off his cold, dead hand. That's what you do most of the time. Right? That's what the vast majority of ring owners have ever done. Right? Bilbo's the only... Well, and Frodo. Bilbo and Frodo are the only ones who, who haven't. Right? Isildur did. Uh, Gollum did. Okay, Deagle got it out of the mud. But anyway, still. Um, um, I think he has to have... I mean, so Trifle, on the one hand, you're right. Like, he's... It's going to... It would be tough. But remember, first of all, he despises Gandalf. He believes he's already way above Gandalf. So yeah, Gandalf with the Ring of Power versus him with his own ring, right? Do I believe that Saruman could convince himself that uh, those odds are at least even? Sure. Sure. Um, uh, I do. Uh, I do think that that's... Um, um, uh, I do think that that's very likely that Saruman could convince himself of that. But there's again, there's no other choice. There's no other choice. He he having failed the one chance of getting Gandalf to hand it over, um, the only other thing he could do is fight. and 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 under what circumstances would it be better? Here's Gandalf, in Saruman's own center of power, right? Saruman's power is nowhere greater than right here in this room, and physical proximity does seem to matter. Right. That that does seem to be a thing um, when someone establishes their sort of domain. Um, um, that's I mean, like you you don't want to fight Sauron in the at the cracks of doom. Right. Um, that's that's like even the you know, even the star glass is not able to shine there. Right. Um, proximity matters. This is the center of Saruman's power. If he can't take Gandalf, Ring Lord Gandalf here, he can't take him anywhere. And if he can't take him anywhere, he's hosed. So he's got to try, right? He's got to try. Um, so, um, and yeah, Belongsman says props to the Ents then. Yes, though, of course, Belongsman will remember the Ents can't get into uh, Orthanc either. Right now, that is partly down to the Numenorians, obviously. But I, I that's also, you know, uh, Saruman is still his own... Um, sort of center of power is left in isolation. Gan well, some of Gandalf's words elsewhere also imply it. He will say that he believes that Saruman has power while in Isengard to resist the Nine. I I outside of Isengard, he wouldn't. Um, so again, his power is stronger uh, in in Isengard. Um, um, yes, exactly, Evil Dr. Cannon. Sooner is better than later, too, because the longer Gandalf has the ring, the stronger he's going to grow and the more he's going to master it. So, um, um, so yeah, I mean, this is... He has set up the best circumstances for this conflict. If conflict is going to be, and he's got to think, Saruman has got to think, that um, uh, Saruman has got to think that it's going to... It's likely to come to that, Right. There's no possible... So, you know, uh, would it be hopeless? No, it wouldn't be hopeless. Um, because Gandalf... And also, because, again, remember, he despises... Because Gandalf's a fool, right? Gandalf is probably not... Remember how Goadriel's going to say to Frodo... Remember ahead to when Goadriel says to Frodo that um, you have to train your mind to the domination of others, right? Um, in, order to, in order to really use the ring. Well, I mean, look, Gandalf's not good at that. Right, Gandalf is a complete noob when it comes to dominating the will of others, and Saruman knows that. Right, Gandalf is soft soap. So, like, what's he gonna do with the Ring of Power? Um, so, um, anyway, that's um, oops, wrong person. Um, that's um, oh dear, we seem to be having issues. Oh well, I'll come back to it. Um, anyway, uh, yeah. Right. Tony says, does it matter that Gandalf had no center of power except maybe the Shire? Um, yeah, it, it is interesting, actually, that Gandalf has no center of power. Um, I think it's one of the things that is more, um, um, more, uh, 
humble, like a, a clear sign of Gandalf's humility, that he never establishes a center of his power. Um, the Shire isn't exactly a center of his power. Um, JJ says, did Radagast tie himself to Ross Gobel? Uh, well, I mean, we don't know that for sure, but I'd have to guess if you wanted to throw down with Radagast, Ross Gobel would be about the last place I'd try to do it. Um, I know saying, like, that's an example of an absurd thing from the Hobbit movies is shooting fish in a barrel, but... Um, but yeah, like the whole like giant spider attack on Ross Gobel, you know, on Radagast's house, like please, you know, uh, whatever. Uh, there were a lot of things done to Radagast in those films, but um, to make him not even able to, like, you know, easily defend his own home against other essentially birds and beasts. I mean, come on. Uh, yeah, he did drive them off lamely. Uh, yeah, no. Anyway, um, uh, not uh, not convinced by that. Um, but whatever. Anyway, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Let's see. Yeah. No, I, I agree with you guys who are saying that the gray wizard seemed like the itinerant nature of the gray wizard seems to be a thing agreed with that. Um, but again, I think it's, it's, uh, that doesn't mean that he couldn't do it. Right. I mean, I don't know that the white wizard was meant to set up his own laboratory here either. You know, uh, is Saruman really fulfilling what the white wizard is meant to do? I think it's, I mean, obviously no, he's not succeeding in his job. Um, but is even setting up at Isengard the way that he has, part of his job description you know it's not just that he did it badly and you know um made some poor choice choices along the way but is that itself a poor choice i think it's possible that it was i think maybe the white wizard is supposed to be wandering around like the gray wizard too just doing different things and focusing on different stuff um yeah yeah um yeah, exactly, Belongsman. Gandalf does say he does not desire mastery. And again, to come back to the passage here, um, Saruman knows it. Saruman knows that about Gandalf. Again, that's one of the reasons he despises him, almost as much as he despises Radagast. Not quite, but almost as much. Um, uh, because he knows that. And again, and somebody who has that mentality, somebody who has Gandalf's mentality, is not going to be uh, a... Um, a very good ring lord, or at least it's going to take him some time to grow into it, right? So, does Saruman think that he could um, that he could take him? Yeah, I think he does think that he could take him. Um, definitely. Um, okay. Um, yeah, Frumius Bujum says, does Saruman know for certain that Gandalf has no center of power? Um, I no, not necessarily. Again, it seems to me fairly clear that uh, Saruman judges Gandalf by himself, right? He he is his own measure, right? His own standard uh, for how to judge Gandalf. So um, he might suspect. I mean, just as he clearly does believe that uh, Gandalf either... Uh, Again, if he's wise, he's going to do like Saruman would do. Uh, if he's a fool, then he's going to do something else. But that's just, you know, then he can just be dismissed, right? Um, so, yes, he certainly would. Um, if Saruman were the Grey, he would have set up a center of power somewhere, right? Um, maybe he thought that's what Gandalf was doing up in the Shire, right? Maybe. Um, but... Um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. So saving yourself much trouble and pain. Um, oh, somebody was suggesting like orc archers and things. Um, that, by the way, I would have found a very much more, still a little bit of an anticlimax in some ways, but a much more convince much better than the bizarre staff fight uh that Gandalf and Saruman have which is in my opinion 
I've gotten this, I've gotten into this habit over the years. Anytime I'm about to complete a sentence that contains a superlative adjective, I always pause in the middle to be like, am I sure I mean this? Um, uh, it doesn't stop me from beginning the sentences, but I've learned the habit of, of not finishing them. I think it's is true. The most ridiculous scene in the Fellowship of the Ring movie. I, I, I can't think of any others that are worse than that. Um, uh, but anyway, um, better than that would have been, you know, Gandalf perceiving the truth, having that moment where Ian McKellen's eyes go really wide and then Saruman like, you know, make some gesture and like orc archers like lean down over the balconies all like, you know, with their arrows pointing straight at Gandalf and him being like, you know, you have no choice but stay. Um, that um, uh, is um, I, th- that that would have been better in my mind. Right. And I and something I absolutely could imagine Saruman doing. Right. Um, again, we have no sense that he did anything of that kind, but, um, um, yeah, yeah. Okay. GDC, you're probably right. The ridiculous business of imagining that by leaning your way to tiny little bit, you can influence the swaying of a multi-ton pillar of rock is probably worse and the dwarf throwing business. Okay. Yes, probably. Um, but, um, uh, but still, it's down there. It's down there near the bottom of my list, the wizard duel. Um, uh, but anyway, okay. So, anyway, sorry, Michael, um, Michael D., you had asked ages ago. Uh, you were sort of asking for confirmation, like, we're only saying, we're only inferring that Saruman thought that Gandalf had the ring. Yes, I'm only inferring. There's no direct evidence that that's what Saruman is thinking here. It's just hard for me to imagine, given what everything that Saruman reveals about his own ways of thought here, it's very difficult for me to imagine that Saruman could not be thinking that. Um, How could Saruman assume? How would it make sense, from Saruman's perspective, for him to assume that um, that Gandalf would know where the Ring of Power was and not have it, right? I mean, he, what's what he would do is secure it, um, you know. But anyway, yeah. Um, so, um, right, so Imaki was uh, suggesting that when Gandalf persists in not using it, when Gandalf defies him here openly, right, calls him out plainly on the carpet and defies him, but does not attempt to use the ring against him, um, does not attempt to establish his own lordship. Um, when his answer to submit to Sauron or to me in fancy words is not, no, I think you should be submitting to me, right? That's the moment when Saruman is like, oh, are you kidding me? He doesn't even have it. Um, I think that that's, I think that that's very, that seems to me very plausible. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, oh, Sam, I, yeah, I absolutely think it's plausible. I I think that Saruman would have to have been preparing for a fight. I think merely the fact that he's wearing his ring shows that he's preparing for a fight. Um, I totally think that Saruman is, 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 like I said, I, I, I think he's armed for bear. I think this is, this is his big chance, right? Um, besides which, even if Gandalf doesn't have the ring, he still might fight, right? I mean, Gandalf is in a complete pushover, um, but Gandalf doesn't fight. Have you others to offer? So being cold and perilous, I think he's recalculating, right? His coldness to Gandalf, I think, enables... This is, in my mind, this is a sign of Saruman's kind of internal recalibration, right? Okay, let me pause for a moment, Gandalf, while I I, I refile you, right, out of the potential tool and ally category into minor league impediment category, right? 
only usefulness as potential source of information on where I can find the ring. You've, congratulations, you've just made yourself functionally irrelevant, apart from the fact that I think you probably do have information. Um, so, um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Now, Tiber says, if Gandalf uh, were wielding the ring, why would he go into Saruman's seat of power to request aid? That could be uh, the... Um, uh, I, I, you could quote Gandalf's line about Sauron, right? Um, about the attack on the Black Gate, right? That he would see the rashness of the new ring lord and say, so, he sticks out his neck too far, right? Um, it would be Gandalf's overconfidence, and somebody who is a fool like Gandalf, who now has claimed the One Ring, would likely be overconfident, right? Because he underestimates me, Saruman, the wizard of many colors, Saruman, ringmaker. He has no idea what he's getting himself into, right? Um, that, I would imagine, would be Saruman's line of thinking there. Um, but... Um, uh, yeah, good. Now, Michael, yes, uh, uh, Saruman seems to imply earlier that he knows it's hidden in the Shire. Yes, his Gandalf's lurking place in the Shire, right? Yes, um, hidden in the Shire with Gandalf, by Gandalf, right? Um, do you imagine that Saruman could imagine that Saruman's uh, first assumption would be that Gandalf's going to leave it behind in the Shire, right? It's clearly in the realm of possibility just because Gandalf's an idiot, right? And is is not going to show wisdom even in his own behalf, right? Uh, so he might do so something like that. But balance of probability can't be pointing in that direction for Saruman, right? Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Yeah, exactly. So, and, you know, this would actually, this would support the idea, and even that lurking place phrase, right, would also support the idea that maybe Gandalf in some kind of, like, bizarre way, I mean, look, Gandalf is a little different. Everybody knows that. Um, the Shire does not really seem like um, a great place to establish your new spiritual stronghold, but maybe that is his plan. Right. Maybe that's why Gandalf is lurking there. Um, and the, the, the nine are seeking for the Shire because they've heard that the ring is there. Right. Um, and uh, but but again, Michael, I would say the nine having heard that the ring is there only proves perhaps that they also found out the same information that Gandalf found. But Gandalf's already obviously knows it. Right. Gandalf obviously got there first before the nine did. Right. Um so just the fact that the fact that it was in the Shire, it's not like he suspects that Gandalf has always had it, right? That Gandalf has had it for centuries, right? He believes that Gandalf has recently discovered it in the Shire because Gandalf, you know, he's he's master's degree in the Shire, right? In Shire studies, um, nobody could understand why he cared about that obscure branch of knowledge. Now it makes sense to Saruman, right? Because he's found the ring there. That's why he's hanging out there in his lurking place there. But now, um, the uh, so the hobbits found it. Somehow the hobbits ended up with the ring of power. And now Gandalf obviously has it because he's got the hobbits in his back pocket, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, Michael, I agree if one were to hide the ring while biding his time, the Shire would be a perfect place. Well, of course, Gandalf thinks it's a perfect place, when he lets Bilbo hide there, um, even when he is suspicious and uncertain. And of course, for the 17 years in which he's feeling fairly confident that that ring is a very big deal indeed, and he lets Frodo keep it there, right? Um, but at the same time, um, he... Uh, at the same time, Saruman... Uh, or, wait, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um yeah, so from Gandalf's own perspective, the Shire is a good hiding place, right? A safe place to keep it. From Saruman's point of view, again, I don't think that there's any difference between it's in the Shire and Gandalf has it. Gandalf has been in the Shire, right? Um, 
at least that's where he's he's sort of kept he's kept coming 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 back to it um but um it's possible that Saruman might assume, Michael, that Gandalf has it but hasn't mastered it, so he may be hiding it while he learns. But I don't think you can learn much without having it. Um, I think he would know enough about Rings of Power and how they work to know that, you know, you can't you can't learn about you can't learn how to master Rings of Power by correspondence courses, right? You can't. Um, um, I don't think there's a remote learning option on mastering the rings of power. And, um, uh, in any way, it's going to be pretty unusual, uh, for the master to set it aside like that. Um, yes. And Sam, that's the thing I keep coming back and tripping on, uh, that Saruman doesn't imagine that Gandalf actually entrusted it to someone. Um, the Shire means in a ditch somewhere in the Shire. Yeah. Not that he would have handed it to somebody, let one of the hobbits actually keep it. That's bizarre. Um, that's bizarre. Um, anyway, uh, yeah, JJ, I agree. If anybody is able to learn mastery of rings of power from a distance, it's Saruman, right? He's, and he knows Gandalf doesn't have his expertise, right? He knows Gandalf hasn't, you know, done his research, exactly whatever that is. Um, but, um, yeah, so you're right, Evil Dr. Kenny. You read between the lines there. It is true that Ring of Power Mastery is not going to be a course we're going to be offering at Signum. Uh, you're precisely you're precisely right on that. I didn't want to have to say it straight out, but, yeah, uh, abandon hope. Um, but, um, anyway, um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, Junior Ringmaking, also, that's not the new program. That's not the new program, JJ. Nope, not at all. Not at all. Um, yep, yep. Um, okay, so... So that makes sense to me, that he now believes that... So now what does he think? Now he thinks Gandalf knows... So Gandalf never claimed it, right? Um, it must be still in the Shire. So Gandalf is now c confirmed, a confirmed idiot. I did not expect you to show. This is below even my low expectations of your wisdom, even in your own behalf, right? Um, you don't, you're not wise enough even to claim the ring once you find it, right? You're going to, so you're going to leave it? Uh, you know, and he doesn't really know for sure. Um, he doesn't know for sure uh, what Gandalf has done with it, right? Has he left it in the Shire? Did he, uh, I mean, what exactly, what is exactly is going on? He doesn't have, uh, Saruman does not have the, inf he still needs information from Gandalf, right? He doesn't know the answers. Um, but, um, but he seems now convinced that Gandalf certainly has not set himself up as a ring lord, like he should have done, obviously. Um, now, a really great, um, a really great, uh, let's see, somebody was making a really cool point earlier on. Someone asked, yes, Lupilia, it was you. Does Saruman know that the Dunedain are there? He could think Gandalf is grouping up with a few strong people in that region, safe away from all the other troubles of the world. Maybe. Does he know about the Dunedain? I think it's doubtful, honestly. How much would the council have discussed the line of Elendil? Right? I mean, Elrond has been shielding it for a little while now, very directly, right, with Aragorn growing up in his house. But even before that, they were known. You know, the the did that ever come up in the meetings? Um uh, you know, I I I, I don't know. I don't know. I mean, like, does... Is Saruman aware that the line of Isildur exists? I don't know what the answer to that question is. I guess I would have to go with probably yes. I mean, no one's been hiding anything from Saruman, right? So, I, I you know... Galadriel knows who Aragorn is, right? Clearly. Elrond knows, obviously. You know, I... I think that Saruman probably does know about them. I don't know that he would necessarily think that they are a big deal. Um, I mean, uh, 
they're just, uh, you know, beggars in the wilderness after all, right? Um, yeah, exactly, JJ. Uh, JJ says, would Saruman care if they've fallen from power? What use are they? Yeah, not much, I wouldn't think. Um, I'm not... Um, I'm not a big fan of the idea that I, I don't think that he would care much. I don't think that he would um, that he would find them very considerable. He's never met Aragorn, um, so he doesn't know. Because look, Aragorn is kind of special. He's not just the ye old next heir of Isildur, right? I mean, he's uh, he not just next in the line. Um, Aragorn's clearly kind of a big deal, right? He is an exceptional person, um, as if destined, right, to be the one to restore the kingship. And, you know, he is given a capacity to do things and to play a particular role in this time. It's no coincidence that the current chieftain of the Dúnedain is somebody like Aragorn, right? That, I, that to me, smacks of conspiracy. Um, you know, no offense to Arathorn and, you know, Eridor and all the rest of the ranger chieftains before him, but um, they weren't the same, you know, as Aragorn. Aragorn's a big... He's extraordinary, even among the Dúnedain. That's very clear. Um, but, um, but Saruman doesn't know that. Saruman doesn't know him, I don't think. Um... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not even going to talk about movie Aragorn, Emily. Yeah, we're not, we're not, we're not even going to go there. Um, but, um, yeah. But it is an interesting question, Lapilia. Um, it is... Thinking about Saruman's assessment of the Shire is an interesting question. We'll come back to this. We'll have other occasions to think about this question. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, anyway. Um, hmm. Uh, David is asking if he's interested in rings of power, wouldn't he be interested in the heirs? Well, I don't think he would consider the heir of Isildur the heir of, um, like the heir of the ring itself. Like he he's, you know, the one who... who who owns it. I mean, Aragorn is pretty quick in saying to Frodo, yeah, no, that's not, it's not like it's my ring or anything, or I have a claim to it. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, so I think that, I don't think that, and nobody really seems to talk that way. Um, it's called Isildur's Bane in the South. Um, it's not called Isildur's Ring in the South. Um, you know, or even as Sildur's, you know, like the Weir Guild for, you know, Elendil or whatever. Um, yeah, exactly. Sam was just saying, I don't think that Saruman honors Isildur's Weir Guild claim. Right. Yeah. So I don't think that he would see them as a, a kind of like a priori threat to the to his own ownership of the ring. He's obviously operating on a uh, finder's keepers model there. Um, but um, yeah, yeah. So I think that he might well think that they are... Yeah, exactly, Tony. They're dying Numenar, right? They're irrelevant in that way. Okay. So, but although he now has concluded for sure that Gandalf does not have the ring, again, you can tell on the fact that we're not fighting right now, um, uh, which is a bit of a letdown, right? But um, frustrating because now he, he was... This was gonna. This was this was high risk, high reward, right? To lure the new ring lord into his domain, into his center of power, fight him here, possibly you know with archers posted and ready to shoot him full arrows at a moment's notice. I would do that if I were Saruman under these circumstances. Um, uh, then, because we know that arrows are capable of killing ring lords, right? There's there's precedent for that kind of thing. Um, but um, anyway, so. Um, so that's not going to happen now, right? And so he says, until you reveal to me where the one may be found, he still does not believe that, Sar that Gandalf has no idea, right? Gandalf obviously knows where the ring is. Gandalf even might have kind of tipped his own hand, right? I would not, if he had just said, but I wouldn't give it if I had it, you know, now that I learn your mind, um, but I would not give even news of it to you might almost be taken to imply that he has news to give, right? Um, 
uh, you know, interesting that you mentioned news of the ring, because that's exactly what I want. Um, I may find means to persuade you. That's a really interesting sentence. Of course, on its surface, that just sounds like a threat of torture, essentially, right? Um, you know, we may find ways of making you talk. Um, but it seems that he doesn't mean that. I mean, I guess he's torturing him by deprivation and exposure on the top of the tower, which is not nothing. Um, but, um, uh, but at the same time, I think that he is... Uh, I'm not sure that that's all that that means. I may find means to persuade you. Or until it is found in your despite. And the ruler has time to turn to lighter matters. Um, oh, Katrin is asking, uh, would Isildur have been killed if the ring had still been on his finger? I think yes. I think it would. Um... Bilbo, for instance, seems to interact with physical objects perfectly fine while he's wearing the ring. Um, you could say that the stabbing of Frodo is a bad data point because it's a spiritual stabbing as much as a physical stabbing. Um, but the physical knife does seem to penetrate Frodo's flesh. Um, and it is a physical knife as well. So... Um, and the physical golem tooth. Yeah, you're right, Sam. The biting off of the finger clearly proves that more than anything else. I wasn't even thinking forward there. I was thinking backwards. But yes, yes. Um, so I do think it's pretty clear that invisible folks, um, th Bilbo's buttons also would seem to prove it, right? Um, yeah, so physical, uh, the invisible folks wearing the ring are still interacting with the physical world in the normal way. So... Um, yeah, and the physical door on Sam's head. Yeah, no, exactly. You're right. There's lots of evidence of this. Um, so, yes, I do believe that had an orc arrow been happening to fly in that direction anyway, uh, it would have killed Isildur anyhow. But his dropping of the ring made him visible and they aimed at him and shot him. Um, and so that's the significance of the ring falling off his hand. Um, but, okay. So Tony's suggesting... I may find means to persuade you. Does he feel that he might come to dominate Gandalf's will? Yes, I think so. Um, I think so. Yeah, good, Emily. That's exactly that. I almost quoted, I almost just paraphrased that line from The Hobbit about, uh, you know, a magic ring, and you know, uh, uh, preventing you from being uh, uh, specially targeted. Yeah, exactly. That's that's just what the line I was thinking of there. Um, anyway, um, so... I don't know what Saruman's assessment of mere mundane torture on Gandalf would be. Um, that is, whether he merely thinks that physical torture of Gandalf, you know, is just going to be too tedious or time consuming, um, or whether he, um, uh, whether he, um, whether it would just be more in his idiom to, uh, you know, dominate the will of Gandalf, Tony, as you're suggesting. Um, that last, of course, embedding that in a Monty Python quote makes it sound silly, um, but I, um, I don't... I don't think it necessarily is. I think that there might be... Remember, he looks down on Gandalf, and now that he knows that Gandalf doesn't even have the Ring of Power... Now he's going to totally look down on Gandalf, right? Um, uh, I think that he does not believe that Gandalf will be able to resist him, perhaps, for long. Look, clearly the best option, right? The best option is for him to, by one means or other, dominate Gandalf's will. Um, and so he puts him on the top of Orthanc, Um well, we haven't even gotten there yet, but he will put him on the top of Orthanc, which is, I agree, Sam, um, kind of like putting Gandalf in the center of his power. Um, yes, 
in some ways. It also, I mean, it has several advantages, right? I mean, he is still there in Saruman's own center of power. He also um, is being subjected, presumably, to mundane um, things like, uh, you know, deprivation, um, like, uh, you know, the uh, deprivation of food and and uh, uh, and water and, uh, you know, sleep and things like that, um, which also, you know, could weaken his will. He's tied to a physical body now. Gandalf is. So. Um, so, yeah, I think that I can see him. Right. No, no tobacco. Frumius Bujum. Exactly. Right. All kinds of deprivation. Um, uh, absolutely. Um, oh, that's interesting, GDC. I'd never thought of that before. A, a sort of parallel between um, Morgoth and Hurin and Saruman and Gandalf. I will put you on the high place where you can look out and see uh, all these things. Um, so it's it's a different kind of um, uh, sort of psychological and spiritual intimidation in that way. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, it also seems to me very likely, um, I don't know, almost a matter of pride for Saruman, right? You know, in a, a natural, an important step in his escalation in his elevation. I mean, he's got... Gandalf is his inferior to begin with, right? Um, he must be able to beat Gandalf, right? To overcome Gandalf. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, Imaki, you were thinking that, too, about uh, uh, not only Hurin, but Maedhros as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, A fitting reward for the hindrance and insolence of Gandalf the Grey. Um, his attempt to give sort of talk some smack back to Gandalf there at the end, I think is really kind of interesting, right? Um, he characterizes Gandalf's resistance, right? Like, you're not resisting me. You're just hindering me a little bit. Um, you're not defying me. You're just being insolent, right? Insolence implies this natural subordination, right? Um, you, you can only be insolent to someone if that person is in a, like, decisively superior position to yourself, right? That's really the only, um, that's really the only opportunity for insolence. Um, yeah, exactly. That's why ch children are very often accused of insolence, or at least used to be, JJ, because, you know, uh, for a child being uh, uh, being cheeky to an adult is, is being insolent, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Um, and his characterizing this as, as a lighter matter, right? Uh, you know, maybe at some point I will deign to find a way to, you know, to punish you properly. Um yeah, yeah. And yes, Evil Dr. Cannon, I absolutely think that Saruman is referring to himself when he talks about the ruler. Um, though, again, the vagueness here, Evil Dr. Cannon seems to me to point in two ways, right? On the one hand, he's going to be like, when I have amassed my power, then I am going to devise something particularly unpleasant for you. But at the same time, he, it still holds open the possibility. Let's not forget, Sauron might win. Right? Would you want Sauron to turn his attention uh, towards rewarding you for your hindrance and insolence? Um, and even, that's even almost a kind of inducement, right? Um, if you don't tell me where the ring is, then Sauron's probably going to get it, right? Who do you want to end up with the ring, Gandalf? Me or Sauron, right? I mean, he could almost flip back the two choices that Gandalf paraphrased before, submit to Sauron or to yourself, he could say to Gandalf, um, your choices are, Gandalf, give the ring to Sauron or give it to me. Right? Those are, those are the only two real options here. Um, so which one of us would you like to be the ruler? Um, 
who is going to devise a fitting reward for the hindrance and insolence of Gandalf the Grey. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so that, I think, is interesting. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Tony, you were just thinking the same thing. Exactly, exactly. Um, um, yeah, uh, Michael says it, it could turn it into give it to me or I'll sell you to Sauron. Yeah, I mean, he has, he, Saruman has said enough to suggest to Gandalf, clearly, um, which, of course, turns out to be true, that he is at least temporizing with Sauron, right? That he's working with Sauron. Um, again, the double-sidedness that is still one of the sides of the double-sidedness of talking about the new power that's arisen, right? Um, he's not only talking about Sauron, but but he is still talking about Sauron as well. Um, so, anyway, I think that uh, it's that threat, you know, I could just hand you over to Sauron, or at the very least, when Sauron gets the... If Sauron gets the ring, yeah. Which one of us do you want dealing with you in the end, Gandalf? It's up to you. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like Gandalf's, um, final remark that may not prove to be one of the lighter matters. He gives him defiance, right? He shows him insolence. Um, but Saruman laughs at him. Um, and Gandalf acknowledges, yeah, my words were empty. Right. I, I, there was, I could not back up that boast, uh, to, to say, oh yeah, like, you know, you'll never take me alive. Right. You know, I, I, it's not going to be that hard, that easy to get rid of me. Um, it's a boast, right? Gandalf boasts there at the end, but it's an empty boast. Right. Um, and Saruman is going to laugh all the more if he was preparing for a big fight with Gandalf and then there's been no fight, right? Oh, please, I was prepared to take you down when I thought you had the Ring of Power, right? Whatever. Um, but, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, it does, uh, it does sound uh, like, in hindsight, it was a pretty weak comeback, Gandalf says. I like the sort of the humility of it, right? That he... Um, that he's, you know, he's like, but, uh, you know, really there wasn't anything I could do, right? I was, um, I was helpless. Um, he freely confesses that he was helpless. And honestly, this seems to be like, why doesn't Gandalf fight? Why don't they, you know, duke it out in some way, which even if they did would probably be more impressive than the film. Um, because Gandalf knows he can't win. He knows he can't win. Gandalf, or Saruman would take him. Easily there in his center of power, even possibly with the support of armed minions. He can't, he can't fight him. He knows this. Um, I think that, well, I think that he can't, he knows he can't do either. I know uh, uh, Tony, I don't, I think that he, he feels he can't win and, uh, and he feels he can't escape. Right. Um, his words are empty. He does not have the power to extract himself. Um, now, you know, on the one hand, Gandalf obviously wins this confrontation, right? Gandalf maintains his integrity. Gandalf resists any temptation. It's not even clear how strongly tempted he was, you know, about most of these things. Um, uh, but, um, uh, yeah, he, um, um, anyway, he, he, He's won the moral victory, right? Um, but he also knows he's trapped. He knows he can't get out of here. He knows that he can't defeat Saruman. He can't overthrow Saruman. Um, and he can't escape. So what's he going to do? What's the point in fighting? Um, yeah. Mudmore says, does Gandalf know he can't die? Not that it would be fun. Um, we see Gandalf taking some pains to preserve his life, right? Um, and not being at all happy about the prospect of death, um, cause his body can be destroyed. And I have to think that at the very least, should Gandalf physically perish, um, that would constitute a failure of his charge, right? 
Um, that's not what doing his job looks like, I think. Um, is there any guarantee he would get? I mean, does he remember that he's from Valinor? Yeah, I think he does. How much memory does he retain of all of the details of Valinor? That's less certain to me. But I do think that he knows what he is and who he is. But he also knows he's been given this body for a purpose. And should he perish and his spirit return into the West, it's not, you know, there isn't a, a subway line, you know? I mean, there's not a shuttle uh, from Valinor. I mean, it, he would... Like, did he fail or did he not fail? Well, you know, internet discussion boards could debate that for a long time, theoretically, but he's not coming back. His work is unfinished in any case, right? No matter what anybody thinks of it. Um, yeah, exactly, Tessa. There's no reason to think, and I would say especially no reason for him to think that he would be resurrected. I think that that's a surprise to Gandalf. I think that's a surprise. Nobody enters, nobody sees that coming, right? Nobody expects the resurrection. Uh, that's pretty clear. Um, uh, yeah, exactly. Exactly, Fourth Thomas. No reason at all to think he's got a return from death card. The exception, the, the, the arrival of the Astari in Middle-earth was a big, fat exception to the rules, right? This was a very special case designed for a very specific function. Um, so even apart from things like fear of death, which he might actually feel because he's incarnate, um, uh, and just the desire to preserve his physical body from pain and from death, um, he may have that. But, but beyond that, whatever else happens when Gandalf dies, he's got to at least think, this is, uh, I've got too much to do, Right. Uh, you know, so he's, he, he certainly is not going to want to die. Um, absolutely. Um, yeah. Um, Tony asks, is this confrontation a spiritual battle like the one later with the Balrog? So yeah, so Tony has a good question. Um, did they fight and we didn't notice essentially, right? Um, like we were looking at with the Nazgul, uh, at Weathertop. I don't think so. I don't see any signs that Gandalf is fighting, Saruman is defeating him here. Um, sometimes there's usually some kind of evidence, right? some kind of evidence that a conflict like that is happening. Whether it's an actual song battle, right? Um, whether it's, I mean, again, there's a lot of outward signs. In the, I mean, everybody looking at the Gandalf and the Balrog scene on the Bridge of Khazad Doom is aware of the fact that there's a conflict happening, right? Um, but, um, uh, but yeah, anyway, so there's some... Um, uh, But it's not just that. Think about the spiritual conflicts in Weathertop. Think about the spiritual conflicts in other places, like especially the ones involving the Nazgul. Think of the spiritual conflict between Frodo and the Witch King at the entrance to Minas Morgul, right? That also is a, a, spir a kind of spiritual conflict between the two of them. Um, but again, there we, we get cues, right? We get cues in the descriptions of Frodo's feelings and emotions, right? What is, something is being done to him at that point, and he's fighting against it. Um, it's an immaterial fight, but it's clearly characterized as a fight. This is not at any point. So I don't think they're fighting here. Um, but... Um, I, I can agree, Fort Thoughtless, if, especially if Saruman was using a ring to boost his voice. There's some conflict. Yet yeah, merely the his uh, Saruman's attempt to use his power to bring Gandalf over to his side and Gandalf resisting that. that. That is a conflict. You're right. You're right. But it's not Gandalf fighting him. That's what I'm... That's what I'm kind of resistant to here. Um... And, you know, somebody was asking, 
about this before. I forget who it was. Um, uh, but would he n- want to not fight Saruman? Because out of pity, even. Not pity like, I know I would just crush you like a bug, so I'm going to have pity on you and not fight you and le- let you live longer. I'm not saying, because I don't think that Gandalf and Saruman have anything like that kind of a disparity in power at this point. Um, but um, but anyway, I... Um, so yes, is Saruman applying power to Gandalf and Gandalf resisting? Yes. And so to that extent, absolutely, it's a spiritual battle. Yeah, in that sense. I, I guess, again, the, the, what the point that I'm trying to make is Gandalf fighting against him. He's resisting, right? He is refusing to be moved or budged, but he's not attacking Saruman. He's, there's no offense here from Gandalf. Um, and, and, and I wonder, he says that Saruman has unmasked himself at last, right? But how bad has he gotten? Is it, is it too far yet? Could he still come down, right? Could he still turn? Could he still make the right choice? Is there a chance that Gandalf could talk him out of this? That Gandalf could affect him? Could Remember, this is Gandalf's job description, right? Kindling, rekindling hearts that have grown cold. Does he submit to captivity in part because he wants a chance to work on him, right? Now, I agree, yes, you, got your, you guys are right. I was deliberately quoting Gandalf's Will You Not Come Down later on. Um, he is going to be more aggressive with this later on. He's going to give Saruman a last choice. Um, he is going to... I think that what happens when Saruman's on the balcony later on, after the drowning of Isengard, that's a fight. That's a fight. Um, although Saruman's fireball at Gandalf was almost as abs- no, just as absurd as the wizard fight in the Fellowship of the Ring. Um, nevertheless, Peter Jackson was correct that a fight was happening there. It was just a not visible fight and therefore arguably less theatrical. Um, but, um, but yeah, is Gandalf still kind of waiting and seeing, you know, how far down the road has Saruman gotten? Um, yeah, I think, um, uh, yeah, and J.J., of course, is quoting Frodo's words about Saruman in the Shire, um, his mercy later on. Um, yeah, Mornowin is saying it does seem like it hurts Gandalf that Saruman has fallen. Yeah, yeah, I don't think his... It might be easy enough for us to imagine that... What is happening in Gandalf's mind here is like, hang on, reclassifying you from ally to villain, right? But it's more than that. It's even more, in a sense, than just a personal betrayal of an ally. It is a betrayal, and that's painful always. But Saruman is one of his peers, right? One of the wizards who came over. And we talked about Gandalf not wanting to die because he doesn't want to fail at his job. Well, here's somebody failing far more profoundly than he would just by being eaten by wolves or stabbed by, or, you know, burned up by fire in the wolf glade in The Hobbit, right? Which is one of the places where we see Gandalf both afraid of death, but also willing to die, in the, to die well if he has to die. Um, but, um, but yeah, it is a personal betrayal, Tony, but it's, this has got to hit Gandalf pretty hard. I think it's got to hit Gandalf really hard, right? Not only what does this even mean, and how long has he been a traitor? But, but yeah, I mean, is there an element of pity in Gandalf's peaceful surrender to Saruman here? I wonder. I, we're not, it doesn't say that, right? We're, you know, but I wonder. That seems to me consistent uh, with what we see in other places, especially the culmination of his treatment of Saruman um, 
you know, after uh, after the the drowning. It's uh, this is where he's ultimately headed, um, you know, in his dealings with Saruman. And J.J., as you were recalling, of course, Frodo's going to follow up that same that same line. Um, and yeah, J.J., very, you're thinking of all the quotes that I'm thinking of. But yes, uh, also uh, Gandalf's words about Gollum and his desire of Gollum's cure. How much more would he desire, desire Saruman's cure? Um, so, yeah, yeah. It's um, uh, not at all surprising to me that Gandalf does not respond to this situation by throwing down with Saruman. And being like, okay, all right, it's on, man. Um, you're the enemy now, uh, so big boss fight, let's go. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, t- 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 you're right. And his hopes for help for Frodo are dashed as well. Like, okay, so I guess uh, nobody around here is going to be resisting the Nine, are they? Um, and now I've just uh, let... So, yeah, I mean, they're... He's got a lot to think about, right? A little me time on top of the tower. Uh, he's going to need some me time to work through stuff, uh, definitely, after this. Um, yeah, yeah. So, okay. Um, I'm going to wrap. I'm not going to start another, uh, because, of course, next we'll get his description. So be, let's be thinking about this stuff. I'm glad that we ended on this note, because I want to be taking our thoughts about Gandalf's perspective, about Gandalf's... Um, attitudes here. Um, I want to be taking that into account as we go into, um, uh, as we go into, uh, the, um, into next week's passage, which is his description of what he sees from on top of the tower and his experiences up there. Um, so we will, uh, We'll see if we can do. I'm going to I'm going to shoot for two passages next time. We'll see this. These have been big ones, right? I mean, these three, the confrontation between Gandalf and Saruman. This is a big deal here, uh, but we'll see. We'll see. All right. Uh, so thanks for joining me for that. I We're going to switch over. I'm going to say goodbye to the folks on Twitter. So we're going to uh, switch over to twitch.tv slash SignumU for our field trip. Um, and uh, thanks for joining me there. And... In our field trip today, we're not going to get killed, right? As if. I mean, there's almost no chance of it. Um, there we go. Sorry, let's see if I can get my. Uh... I don't think. Hang on, I think I need to go out and come back in again. My uh, my interface is not working properly. How impolite of it. Well, you know what? It's enough. I don't really need to use my skills, so it's fine. Um, it's not like anything I can do is going to keep me alive anyway. So for those of you who are coming along on the field trip, um, do, come up on stage and we'll... Do, Druid's Fire, could you, uh, could you form a fellowship for us here? Oh, I had already scampered because I am not a captain or I'm not a champion. Oh, you or, scampered, right? Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay. Paper bear done scampered because I don't have my milestone set to where we're going. Okay, we'll tell you Sorry. what then. Let's just meet, let's let's meet over there and we'll 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 follow up over there. So I'm gonna take the stable master. So let's uh, let's all just head up. Where, uh, wait, what's the name of the town again? Holtvist. Holtvist. Come to Holtvist. 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 Not no T. Holtvist. Uh, to Holtvist in uh, the the uh, near not far from the Gladden Fields. And the Vales of Anduin. That's it. That's where we're going to be. Hey, look, I figured out how to open the door. And because um, I can't even left click on anything tonight, but that's OK. It's more exciting that way. And um, yeah, so we're going to we're going to st- continue exploring a part of the game I've never seen before. So I'm this is a this is a real exploration on my part. And why am I running that way? Because it's just not the right way. Oh, but I can't mount up. So that's okay. I, who needs a horse? I'm going to be on foot today anyway. Um, so yeah, If um, I had a rally horn and we could fill up and I could summon you, but I don't have any of those. That's okay. I could. I think I have some. I might be able to send you. Well, actually, I don't think Narnian does. And I've got so much Rally junk. horn wouldn't help I do. You. I have one rally horn. But, yeah. Well, anyway. Um, no, I was just saying I could send one to you, but, um, 
Anyway, okay. So yeah. So, um, but not only, of course, is this a place that I've. Um, uh oh. Hang on. I can't click accept. Darn it. Yep. None of my clickings are working. Gonna there is still. It is going to be one of these. There's still something deeply wrong with my. Um, user interface. I just don't know. It's deeper than usual. I'm, I'm honestly suspecting it has something to do with your um, your aspect uh, your aspect ratio because I've noticed sometimes when I've had games that are in full screen, full screen window, whatever, if I didn't have things set up correctly to, to match what the computer thinks the monitor should be doing, yeah. then my clicks happen in the wrong place. Like, mm -hmm. it's looked, the hitbox is in the wrong place. That's just what was happening with my left click. So I don't know if you noticed when the couple times I had to log back in, I couldn't mount, hover my mouse over the login button. I had to hover it, mm -hmm. like, to yep. the right of it. Um, let me... That's exactly, yeah. Let me... Just... Because, see, look, when I resize it, it's not even proportioned right. It's, like, all messed up. Yeah, as, it's 4 as, by 3 Yeah, as soon as I saw this, I was like, oh, man... This is just not good. Um, yeah. Okay, well. We can try to send another invite and see what happens. How can I be of service? Oh, no, wait. Shoot, I can't even click on the destination. Because it's not even when I move my mouse around. Oh, wait, hang on. Oh, it's, it's, it's north of it. Okay. Let's see if I can do this. Hang on. No problem. This is easy. I can click an inch up from where I'm supposed to be. Let's see. Hold this. Hold. There it is. Hold this. Oh, yeah. No problem. I got this. Okay. All right. Um, when I get there, send me another uh, fellowship request. We'll see if we can do it. Sure can. Yeah, fortunately, I don't really need to interact with much. Just look at things. Okay, here we are. Well, here I am. You guys have already been here. Okay. All right. There we go. Wait. Where was it? Got it. <laughs> yeah. Found it. Okay. Excellent. All right. Oh, yeah. No. All right. I'm going what to be assign the minstrel to you. Okay. Well, I'm, you know, there are fortunately no bears guarding the gate here, so I should be fine. I guess if I stray out here, deer might come and assault me. Yeah, pretty much. Uh, so, and I do want to stand outside the gate. In fact, I'm going to start from outside the gate. So folks might want to, like that warg has malicious intentions, obviously. Yeah, we're fine. We're fine. What's the worst that could happen? So until some landscape animal assaults me, I'm going to stand out here because I want to look at the gates. So we've got a basic wooden structure. The towers are stone and wood. That palisade is the lamest excuse for a palisade I've ever seen. Even goblins build better palisades than that. That's an insult. But I know, true. but I mean, hey, like I call it like I see it. I mean, look at that gaping hole. Did some, maybe the bears who guard the other town just came and wrecked this for fun recently as a kind of prank? I'm wondering if that's the case. But anyway, okay. I'm trying to see what we can learn about the culture of these people from their architecture. So the first thing that we see, of course, is these really cool looking pillar statues, um, which are men with nice beards. It's a very Anglo-Saxon looking face. It looks almost like the, like the famous... Uh, uh, Sutton Who mask, you know, a mm -hmm. helmet mask. Yeah. Um, uh, the helmet 
It's got a really simple helmet. You look at the, the kind of, I think you can see around the bottom, what looks like sort of Celtic knotwork in the in that rim around the base of the wooden helmet of the wooden statue here. Certainly the carvings on the sides, which seem to depict what? Uh, There's birds corn and, on one. Yeah. I think it's corn. It might be a bird. And I, well, I, see, I, I see a bird like so like here. This is a like a like a waterfowl maybe sta standing with its like a goose perhaps with its neck down. Um, yeah, JJ, I agree. The statue looks almost like a dwarf. I mean, it's almost not quite proportioned like a dwarf, but sir, more, sh surely more dwarf-like than man-like. But that doesn't necessarily lead me to think that it's um, actually like designed to represent a dwarf. Um, the carvings on the side look to me very like Rohiric carvings. I mean, I think that we can see also, oh, this guy is adorable. He's got a different helm, still clearly a helm. It's got a nose guard, right? A little triangular Heck nose guard coming down. Yeah. This guy's got his eyes open. I thought this guy's eyes just didn't have eyes, right? I thought this was just... But this guy seems to have his eyes closed. So we have a guard statue with his eyes closed over there because this one clearly has his eyes open. Though this one looks like he's in the act of rolling his eyes. Um... And it's interesting that you say that the carving looks Rohiric because, yeah, that's part of the story here. I would think so, right? I would expect... Now, because, you know, just where we are, right? Map, map, okay. Uh, hey, look, I can write quick. Um, this is like the, you know, it's from up in the north up here that the Rohirrim came down, right? So we're, we're, yep. we're getting closer to... Um, where the, you know, the Eothayod uh, was from, so that there would be a link to Rohiric culture, I would expect. Um, yeah, it may, plays a major part of the story. Even the helmet, this helmet, I mean, is a rather Rohiric-looking helmet, right? This guy has a, an overall kind of Rohiric, um, you know, look to him. Um, for me, because of his hat. Um, though I love the fact that... So the, one of the guards is asleep, and the other... This one looks, frankly, hung over with his, like, really prominent lower eyelids and things. Um, and the two, stat, the two pillars have two faces. There's one on the front, and there's a, a lesser defined one on the back of each one. They, do, they have another face? Yeah. I, 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 had, I can't see it for the... It's really hard. Oh! Okay, hang on. Almost can see it. There it is. And wow. both of those are different as well. Can I get up on the stone? Oh, good, I can. There we go. My goodness, he does have a face in the back of his head. It's Little a mark. face that looks like that. What's his name? The big monstrous Muppet who bursts through the screen at the end of the Muppet movie? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sweetums. Yeah, his face looks like that, doesn't he? Um, yeah, Sweetums, yeah. 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 Um, at least the mouth very much reminds me of him. Slightly less prominent jaw, obviously, but who doesn't have a less prominent jaw? Um, I, wow, okay, I'm glowing green now. Um, anyway. Did somebody put a bubble on you. Yeah, well, that's kindly. It's kindly meant, no doubt. Um, interesting. The face turned backward is asleep. Is this face got his eyes open? Oh, there's nothing for me to jump up on. Um, oh, but I can see it over here anyway. Nope. These faces are very similar, though. The ones facing backward, though this one is better to find. Yeah, it's got Celtic spirals and like a leaf pattern in the middle. Ooh, look at those spirals! Oh, yeah! Look at the spirals! Oh. Newgrange thoughts. Oh, can you even... All right. Um, oh, the swirlies. Well, we've got to look out for that because that suggests a cultural connection with the ancient Brelanders, right? With the the old culture of men. Is that a way of kind of linking it back to, like, these are the old men who have been here since, 
you know, before the Dunedain and all that? Very possibly. That is they interesting. They don't really touch much on the the men side of the thing. Mm -hmm. Mainly the the history of the Bjornings and the history of the Ro the Proto Rohirrim. Right. The Aerolingus. The style of this is very similar to Rohiric watchtowers. Though of course one could ask the question, what else is a watchtower supposed to look like? But um, uh, so I don't want to read too much into that. But um, see, this is a much better palisade, guys. That outer one. Really, I need some serious help. Um, looking at your clothes. Oh, no, that is your hair. I didn't know if it was a hair or a floppy hat, but it is a hair and a headband that he's wearing. That is an axe or a staff? Staff that he's holding? Not sure, but not that I want to find out. I've got a bad record with guards. Um, yeah, I don't uh, see a blade on it. I don't see a blade on it either, but it might be embedded in his chest. Do you but, see the little thing on his belt? It looks kind of like a pocket watch hanging off, but it's the, oh. the, the man face. Hey, you're right. He's got a little charm. And and it's the, the eyes closed face. That does not bode well for a guard, but, you know. Well, I wouldn't have thought that any of them were really exemplary and inspiring guard images, but... Um, Hmm. Okay. I'm also interested in the mossy logs. Like the green furry logs that they're using for some of these things. Yeah, they're like super mossy compared to like the palisade, which they got a little bit of lichen on them, but nothing yeah. like yeah. really like, oh my god, I've been sitting in a swamp for five years. Yep. Yep. Exactly. Um Awesome. Oh hey. Gilgaladi, glad you could join us tonight live. I had a new person joining us live tonight. That's excellent. Um, yeah. At least the sheep aren't attacking you. Hey, that's something, right? I'll, I'll count my blessings. The sheep and the... Hey, who's killing the sheep? Did they... Des or did you just put them to sleep? No, no, they've been permanently put to sleep. Don't kill off the sheep. That's rude. Um... Okay, here's a guy driving nails into another one of these mossy. So this just must be a testament not to the wood, but to the moss. That uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it looks like the moss here. has been growing up on everything. Yeah. Because speaking to somebody who used to, you know, cut down trees as a kid for a thing, uh, the mossier trees generally did not give you really good firewood, and they right. were really not very strong because the moss was taking it over. Yeah. 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 Oh, I love these kinds of cows that look like they really should not be able to see anything at all. Those are cute. Okay. All right. Now, look at these little hutmans. See, this, of course, is a little bit reminiscent of, like, Klanuk, right? Of, uh, mm -hmm, uh, you know, mm -hmm. in, uh, down in Enidwaith. Um, oh, but look at the little chimney pieces, the little offset little... That's adorable. Little bark, they're made of bark, it looks like. Little bark cones up at the top. And you've got these mossy roofs, right? They're taking the, they're taking it and running with it. So we've got some simple, not quite cylindrical, it's more octagonal, but like gently octagonal. So it's mostly round. Yeah. I, I would imagine the roofs are actually proper sods for something yeah. rather than like, you know, branches possibly because there's obviously wood and there's like a wood frame and you have like it's not thatch right so it's something thrown over top no yeah I mean, they seem a little steep for sod roofs but maybe i mean normally sod roofs are a little flatter than mm -hmm, that mm -hmm. but yeah, we've seen them in the shire yeah exactly um darn it or another cool place you'll eventually get to see yeah okay the wonderful, beautiful name of Lindleby. Okay. Well, we'll see when we get there. This pattern, this, um, you know, sort of radial... What's that reminding me of? Where did I see that? Hmm. I can't place it. Go 
kind of reminds me of the star pattern from the Hornburger, only because I've recently done the story tale right. uh, through Helm's no, I'm definitely not thinking that, because... You haven't been there yet. Well, yeah. Okay, that's clearly a thistle. Now that I see them big, they're a little bit easier to identify. That, I think, is clearly a thistle. On its um, side? Leaning over on yeah, its side? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, on its okay, side. I see it now. I thought it was a sheaf of corn, personally. Well, an ear of corn. So maybe. It, works I mean, well. it could be a stylized ear of corn. This one on this side looks a little bit more ear of corny because it goes down further. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So I could see that. There's my uh, goose or whatever it is. Yeah. Might be a fisher bird. I mean, because the uh, Gladden fields are mainly, it's the river and it's very watery. It's, a, it's definitely a, a wetland. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this old split totem-ish thing with these old carvings in the middle of town. This whole town gives this, I mean, the moss is a big part of it, but it gives this, um, uh, uh, but it's, um, it gives a sense of antiquity, right? Like this place is really ancient. The simplicity of the architecture suggests it too, right? And here's another one of those dudes. This is the sleeping dude with another sleeping face in the back. So they're they're looking in all directions, these guys. Now, where, where was... Let's see. Somebody... JJ, where did you find the other... the other guy? The hungover guy? Over here? Oh. Yeah, this one's got open eyes. Okay, so right... The, that right this one is the hungover guy again with the this guy is different he's also wearing a helm with a nose protector even more prominently i love how somebody was pointing this out before the um uh, these ones the ones with open eyes also have eyebrows i did notice that but there's like three of them here yeah for a second this... i thought one of them was split but it's like wait a minute that's those are different this one in the middle is new. That is, he wasn't at the gate, but um, from behind. Huh. Hmm. Well, this other one is not even really a face. The one on the... What is it? East sign, the one that's closest to me right here. Okay, on the front it is. It doesn't have a face at all on the back. It's only so big, and I guess they, they set their design in a certain stylized fashion, I suppose. Is this middle one the same front and back? I can't decide. I think he is. Kind of, yeah, it does look that way, except, you know, the the, the log is obviously either weathered or has been split in some fashion. Yeah. Um. But that also you know speaks to the age of the, the settlement. Uh, these things, if they're just simply weathered, that's a long time. Yes. Yes. And these guys over here up on the hill, it's like the front and the back. This, this is, that's clear. Does he have a face on the other side? Yeah, he does. Yeah, these guys are standing, well, not back to back. They're side by side, but they're facing in opposite directions. I wonder if the one side means one thing and the other side means another thing, you know? Like with the charm that you have in your belt, do you like turn it one way for one reason or turn it, um, you know, for another, in another you know what I mean? Like, does it have? Yeah, could you know, like a good side and a bad side, or an older side and a newer side, possibly. These do seem to be. I mean, there's there's a very significant difference between the the quality of carving, the level of carving. This is like this this the guy in the back has a beard, has a lower lip, 
has eyeballs, vaguely, um, has a kind of nose, um, but has no arms or anything else, just a hat. Um, whereas the guy on the front of that same statue has hands, fingers, something in his hand, uh, uh, hairs in his beard, right? Texture in his beard, a distinguished mustache with also textures, eyebrows, um, pupils, as well as irises in his eyes, nostrils. I mean, it's a very There's different more hat on the more defined side. What yes. I perceive to be the newer side is more hat, less beard. Yeah, it's got this big, like, conical helm thing going on. Um, yeah. But it does make me wonder. And, but, but it's clear, though, that it's not like we're looking at something that was carved, I think, by a, like a much more recent generation or something like that. There's just seem to be... Are they two different aspects? They're, they're all old. I mean, they're all very old. Yeah, there doesn't seem to be anything that would indicate one side was carved significantly sooner like the age of the actual the physicality of the carving doesn't seem to be newer like there's the same amount of lichen on either side exactly that's just exactly what i'm thinking so i'm looking around at people's belts only one of these three guys has one of those tokens on his belt she does not those are all wearing a bit of tartan going on here she does not. She's got a hatchet, though. Watch out for this lady. Well, this guy's got the charm, but he has it on a pendant around his neck. Veramund. Wait, who does? This guy right here by the oven. Veramund. Ah, didn't see it around his neck. Yep. Actually, so does the provisioner. Yeah, no, you're right. I didn't see. I was just looking at their belts. They're sneaky. Yep. Okay, but now notice it's the older faces in all of these, mm -hmm, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, none of them have been the newer face. She's not got it anywhere. So far, it's been only men. We've not seen any women with these charms. Nope, she does have one at the end of her does she? trailer on her belt. Yeah, the bottom of her belt. Ah, way down there. Right, like a... Oh gosh, that's almost rosary-like. Yeah, yeah. The way it dangles from her belt like that. Otherwise, she's got these two wooden uh, things holding her, her fur cloak on. I mean, they look like wood. There's a little bone design on them. Huh. Let's see if anybody else has one. Well, this kid doesn't have one. Look at... Their metalwork is pretty good. I mean, yeah. apart from the fact that their armor, I mean, look at this lady. She's one of the only armored ones we've seen. Um, it's not well, intense. Like, she's not wearing plate mail or anything. Um, but the the charm is, is definitely a village symbol because I'm yeah. seeing it... Like, I'm running over to a bunch of the other NPCs, and they either have it on their belt or on the rosary, like, cord. I even saw one on a kid. Like, one kid had one and one kid did not. So, it's definitely a thing. Yeah. Like, Mappy didn't have one, but the other kid over here does, and so does, presumably, her their parent. Well, that old lady disproves that it's a pure gender thing. Like, it's just for men. But it still does... Yeah, she's got it too. Yeah, like most of the women characters do have them. Dangling on that rosary mm -hmm. thing. Like these two ladies over here have yeah. one either on a rosary or right off her belt, just like everybody else. Oh, she does? Yep. Oh, yeah, there she does. No, not quite like everybody else. They The men have it on, like, two loops that stick out from the side of its head. 
she has it dangling from a single. I think she's just got hers. Yeah, you can even see it. If you look, you can see she's got her rosary thing wrapped up around her like girdle there. Yeah, she's got a, you know, she basically didn't want it flapping around in the breeze. Exactly. But I, I think she, care of it. Exactly. I think she got the same rosary. But yeah, she doesn't like to, you know, be kicking it with her knee every time she, uh, um, every time she walks. Okay. But, but they do wear them differently, generally. Again, even, yeah, even that one I think is differently. Because we haven't seen any men with these charms either, the, the rosary type things. No, I haven't seen anybody wear that style. How about the child? Is this does this child? Excuse me, lady. Pardon me. Does this child had a had one of the charms? Yeah, on on the belt onto the right hand on the right hip here. Aha! Darn it! I'm trying to. Yeah, it's wrapped up there, but it's not hanging. So if you, it's not hanging by the two loops that we saw from that first man. And from several of the other men over there. Interesting. Possibly could be like a rank significance or maybe just a personal preference. Like, hey, I want to wear mine like this or I want to wear mine like that. All right, he's got it around his neck. They've got glass. Look at that. Mm-hmm. And like, look at all the metal on these shutters. Bands of metal. And, and lots rivets. and lots of nails and roots, yeah. Well, the glass is not unusual. We've seen the glass in um, Fenmarch in, in Rohan. You haven't been there yet properly, but it's, it's not unfamiliar. Right. No, it's just a lot of, like, when we first came in and what we were looking at were those, you know, rounded stone huts and that kind of, I mean, I would not have been so, I mean, you don't see glass in Hanuk, I don't think. No, glass is definitely more of a modern culture sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm. I'm not saying I'm shocked. I'm just saying it's an it's a it's an important marker, right? I mean, these people are not as. Uh, now, what is this guy's problem? Who's, he's a dwarf. Yeah, he's a Jalruka dwarf. Did he lose a bet? Do they all dress like leprechauns? Um, not like leprechauns per se, but that is an outfit that Jalruka have. Okay. You can so actually he, buy it in the store. He's doing that on purpose. Yeah. Okay. There's no pot of gold here. Okay. Um, all right. But he's, um, huh, Okay. No, seriously, I mean, that dwarf looks like he could be on a Lucky Charms box, but <laughs> um, yeah, GDC says he looks like he's going to go guard the Pope, right? In other words, he looks ridiculous, right? Yes, yes. Um, I know no more comical uniform on planet Earth than the uniform of the Swiss guards in the Vatican. Um, huh, Okay. So a really interesting blend of very significant um, antiquity here, right? This, these ancient wooden statues, clearly embraced by the current generation. You know, these are not like the Pukulmen, you know, which like nobody even pays attention to anymore because they're, you know, just all sort of old and part of the landscape. Um, it's clear that... Um, um, it's 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 an active part of their culture. The fact that they're all wearing, almost all, you know, wearing that like a kind of charm or or token or something. Insignia. Yeah, certainly seems to suggest that they really it's part of their identity as a people. Um, so we've got in that sense, like the old and the new. It's 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 still a current part. It's still a current part of their culture, whatever that part is. Um, it's still a current part, whether those are meant to, you know, characterize, 
you know, something more like ancestral, like the you know the guardians of their fathers or something like that, or you know heroes of old, or whether they are meant to be depictions of gods, local gods perhaps, or I don't know. Um, but again, it's still clearly part of the live culture. We have evidence of again. I'm not reading much into the moss because, of course. I mean, I've also known that like moss and lichen can grow pretty fast, so it doesn't like this, you know, shed that, you know, uh, Mr. Frosted Lucky Charms is standing next to doesn't actually have to be, you know, a shed that's been standing here for 400 years. It, you know, could just be part of the climate, you know, that this particular kind of moss or lichen grows around here a lot. But nevertheless, um, as I said, we do have um, evidence of some more ancient stuff. You know, now that I've been around town, these two old buildings stand out so much more. I'm thinking these two buildings are like the original town. That would make sense. The stone would last longer. Yeah. These two, th so these are what's, and notice how they're not used at all. There's no doors. Like they're just here. They're, and like they're set aside by walls and paths. It's like this is the town green, right? And in the middle of the town green, they've preserved these two old stone hutments with the, you know, the bark chimneys and stuff at the top. Um, just designed to make them look a little bit more like Hershey's Kisses, I think. And, um, <laughs> but they've preserved them and everywhere else they've built these much nicer, much more modern wooden houses with glazing and, um, not too much in the way of decorations. Like the wood isn't carved, for instance, but all the, as I said, all the, like the metal shutters that I, you know, the, the reinforced metal shutters, the reinforced metal doors. Right? I mean, you've got the bands of metal across the doors. Um, yeah, so... Not everybody has the charm. She doesn't? Maybe that's why she's looking so sad. Probably. Don't be sad, but, lady. You've got nice armor. Well, this, this group was like a confluence of, you know, the wilder folk, and then also, you know... They've had a lot of ties with the Diornings up the hill in Vegbar. Mm -hmm. So presumably there would have been some cross-pollination. And so some folks here are part of the one culture and some are not. Perhaps. Yeah, so I see no evidence of... Of course, again, I'm, this is a blank slate to me, right? So I don't even really know what I'm seeing around here. So I'm going to conclude these are not Bjornings. I see no bear evidence around here. That's nothing that suggests anything particularly bearish uh, here. I don't... I think Tomas is, uh, was asking are these uh, related to the woodsmen described in The Hobbit. I suspect so. Yes. I suspect so. I mean, that's that's just what I would expect to see here, given geographically where we are. Another one of but those... But they're still under carvings. the Bjornings' ages, because they're all... Yes, the because that's time. what Bjorn did in The Hobbit, mm -hmm. was join together all of those folks into one people. Um, oh, look, a horse. Okay, that's something I haven't seen much of. I mean, there was a stable master, but like you can't draw any conclusions from that. And it's a war horse, not just like a regular old riding mm -hmm. horse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Is this leaving town? Does this path leave town? Uh, leads into danger, I think. Eventually. Uh -huh. Yeah, this looks like a path that leads into danger. Yeah, this looks like we're leaving town. Okay. Well, let's not go too far into town. All right. Um, well, we should probably stop. We're getting to the end of our time here. Um, and, uh, but, um, but okay. All right. So Holt Vis was good. Um, this was really interesting. We can see the old and the new. We can see continuity in their culture, but we can see um, 
changes having happened, right? The wooden constructions versus those old relics in the middle of the square. Um, did I see the ta statue collection up at the chieftain's house? No, maybe we'll look at that next time before we head out. From here, let's see, where do we go next? Let's head... Should we just go to the Gladden Fields? Let's just go to the Gladden Fields. It's up to you. That's that's my first goal. We're pretty close to Ross Goebel, so... But, like, the Gladden Fields are the primary tourist attraction around here. So, Actually, Ross Goebel is. Well, no, I mean, for, like... That's what drew me here. Ross Goebel's pretty good, too. I mean, admittedly, that's interesting. So, yeah, let's head out. So next time we'll come back, we'll, we're going to be probably, because I'm going to be using the Stable Master from here for quite some time. Um, so I'll we'll Stable Master to hold this, and then we'll start from here. And I'll, I'll, I'll look at the Chieftain's House, JJ, and uh, uh, then we'll head out to the Gladden Fields. And I want to see what we can reconstruct of the battle of the of the, of the disaster of the Gladden Fields there from from that. So awesome! Thank you everybody for joining me. I know today wasn't much of a challenge in keeping me alive because we stayed in the town where we don't get attacked by bears. Um, that's one of the nicknames of this town, the town where you don't get attacked by bears. Uh, so we'll be back next week and journeying off into the wild. So um, definitely going to need some protection from the deer and squirrels as we venture out next time. So that'll be fun. Um, awesome. Very cool. Thanks everybody for joining me and I will see you guys next week as always. Thanks. Bye now. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of the Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.